Welcome to this teaching video from Freedom Amarillo. We're encouraged that you're in search of the truth and trust that you will find these teaching videos very helpful to you. If you have any questions, please contact us by using the contact tab on the home page. We're delighted that you're with us today. Today we're going to deal with uh, the birth of the Messiah. It's a, a, a traditional time of the year to be able to think about the birth of the Messiah and we hear it all in the air. We uh, think about the star in the east and uh, the Bethlehem story. We see the traditional Joseph and Mary and the baby in the manger, uh, which probably was a cave or, or maybe a, a stable. And we typically see in the pictures and the teachings uh, a lamb and a donkey and maybe some others, even a cow with the baby Jesus, Yeshua, there in the manger. Well, I would, uh, I'd like to uh, encourage you today to think with me and uh, to challenge your thoughts about the traditional story of Christmas and uh, look at some evidence that we have. In many people's minds, we'd be talking about Christmas as December 25th, uh, when the world has decided to celebrate the birth of the Messiah. Uh, today I want to challenge you to look with me at some evidence about the birth of the Messiah and understand why we celebrate the birth in the fall at the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Let's look at some uh, parts of the traditional Christmas story found in Luke and let's look for clues as to when the Messiah actually was born. Looking at Luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it says, and it came to pass in those days that there, were, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made with Cyrenius when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all that they had heard, it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now that's the traditional story and you've heard it many times and read it I'm sure in your homes but as we look at that can we define when did this happen? 
and we saw a lot of details about the happening of it. But let's go back and see if we can determine a little bit closer of when this actually happened. So we're going to go back to the beginning of Luke and find some details as we read through that. We'll go to Luke 1, and we'll begin uh, in the first verse, and let's read that together and let's search for some details. Luke 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Okay, now it looks to me like that our author here, Luke, remember who is a Gentile, is writing and uh, after the research that he's done, remember he's a physician and a very meticulous writer of great detail. So we look at Luke's account here and he says, I have carefully investigated everything and it seems good to me to write an orderly account. So it should be a chronological order, should be telling us what's happening. And then in verse 4 he goes on and says, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So I believe he's giving us some clues for us to search into these scriptures and look at them very, very deeply and see if we can find out some hidden things, maybe not hidden, but that we've overlooked before. Verse 5 goes on and says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, now, there's the time frame that's given to us. Now, the typical time frame of Herod, the king, was from B.C. 73 to B.C. 4. We have a lot of evidence uh, throughout history that that's very close uh, to the time of King Herod. So we're looking at uh, before 4 B.C. because we have a history of, of his death in 4 B.C. As a matter of fact, there's a very interesting article in the National Geographic in 2002, the January issue, that is titled The Life of Herod the Great. And in that, it, uh, it, uh, it uh, implies and teaches us that he was the king, the ancient king of Judah. And uh, he, it talks about his awful death. They call it a grisly death. Uh, it's more, more than 2,000 years ago, and no one seemed to know exactly what happened uh, to the king, but a physician at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle has done some research and thinks that she understands why the king died. And he probably died, according to her research, of chronic kidney disease that was complicated by a nasty case of gangrene. It was an awful death that Herod died. He was still young in 4 BC. Now, as we look at Herod and find some information about him, we find that he was a friend of the Emperor Augustus, and he knew Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony, those that we've studied and read about in history. And uh, he had uh, great achievements. Among some of his greatest was the largest artificial harbor in the Mediterranean area. So we see that King Herod lived from 73 to 4 BC. So if uh, this happens, uh, the story in Luke is telling us, happens during that time frame, we're going to see that the Messiah was born before 1 AD, at least back into to 3 or 2 uh, because of the things that Herod was involved with. Now let's go back to our verse, verse 5. It says, in the time of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. So we begin to look at Zechariah and see the details of what we can find about him. It tells us here, Luke does, he belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So Zechariah was in the priestly division. He was a, a, a priest, a, a Levite, uh, from the heritage of, of uh, Aaron. And he was in the division of Abijah. Now, we'll, we'll look at the, that in just a minute. We find out a little bit more about 
Zechariah and Elizabeth in verse 6, it says, Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. So we can look at that and find out that they followed the commandments of the law and the, the calendar that was uh, present. So we can look at some dates and it'll help us, I believe, with that. Verse 7 says, But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, now that's Abijah's division, remember, uh, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now remember, as we look at the temple, we uh, go into the holy place, not the holy of holies, but before we get there, into the holy place. And on our left is the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick. On our right is the table of showbread. And directly in front of us, in front of the curtain going into the holy of holies, is the altar of incense. And so upon this particular day, Zechariah, while he was on duty went into the holy place and burned incense on the altar. And while he was doing that, we find out that the angel comes and appears to him. So let's see if we can figure out about this time. When would this have been? What time of the year would it have been when Zechariah went to the temple? Now, he was, uh, Luke gives us the clue that he was a part of the priestly division of Abijah. So we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, and we find that Samuel assisted King David and helped him to set up the priestly divisions, put them in order, as well as gatekeepers and others that worked in the temple and took care of the, the articles and all the things that happened there. And it tells us in chapter 9 that, that that was set up by King David. Now, if you fast forward a little bit to chapter 24, you'll see the list of the divisions in order of how they were given. So if you look in chapter uh, 24, verse 10 of First Chronicles, you'll find that Abijah was the eighth division. Now, history tells us, tradition tells us, uh, writers from uh, that period tell us that the priest served from Sabbath to Sabbath. Oh, they served for a week. They began at the first week of the year, the first division, and they worked through. There were 24 divisions, so 24 weeks, and then they started over, and then another 24 weeks. Well, we have, that's 48 weeks of the year, but we realize that the year is longer than that. Uh, in, our, in our estimation, it's 52 weeks. But if you look at the Hebrew calendar that they were working under, there would be 51 weeks. So we've got 48 of them covered by these, and we've got three more weeks. Well, how did that work? Well, you find that the, uh, all of the priests, all of the 24 divisions were there on hand during the three traveling feasts. That would have been unleavened bread, uh, Pentecost or Shavuot, or, and tabernacles or Sukkot. Uh, so those three times a year, and you put those dates in there, and uh, you'll find that uh, if Zechariah, being a part of the division of Abijah, the eighth division, would have actually served during the tenth week of the year, because we would have had unleavened bread and Pentecost when all the divisions would be there. So we can mark uh, Ab uh, Zechariah's time as being the tenth week of the year, okay? So, now let's go back. Verse 9, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. When his time of service was completed, now that's that week, the tenth week of the year, uh, 
he returned home. After this, it doesn't say how many days or how many weeks, but after this, we assume that it was soon, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. In the sixth month, sixth month of what? Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now we know the rest of the story. Uh, Mary uh, becomes pregnant and she has uh, nine months or 40 weeks as we see a biblical principle, 40 weeks, and we have the birth of the Messiah. So if we can assume that we would know when Zechariah was in the temple and the angel spoke to him, we can come pretty close to when the Messiah was actually born. So we look at uh, the sixth sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy and we begin to count that and, and calculate when the Messiah was born. Now I did a little uh, a diagram for us and I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. You look at that and we'll see if we can calculate this together. There are 12 squares or 12 months in the year. We'll build a calendar and uh, 4 and 3 make 12. We'll number those. So 1 through 12, we've got a year there. So now we realize that Zechariah went to the temple in the 10th week of the month, or that would be in the middle of the third month. Depending upon what day of the week uh, the year started in the first month, uh, we'd, it's uh, the middle toward the, the third week of uh, the third month that Zechariah would have been in the temple. Now it says after he uh, finished his requirements in the temple, he went home and Elizabeth became pregnant. So we're going to mark that either the end of the third month or the beginning of the fourth month. We would see that Elizabeth would have become pregnant. Now it says that she stayed in seclusion for five months, but in the sixth month, uh, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel. So we're going to mark that six months from the time Elizabeth became pregnant would be the end of the ninth month or the beginning of the tenth month that Mary would have become pregnant. So if you take 40 weeks from there, or nine months, you're going to see that Yeshua, Jesus, was born in the middle of the seventh month. Now, on the Hebrew calendar, we realize what happens in the seventh month. That happens to be the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it begins in the middle uh, and it lasts for eight days. I personally think that this is a clue that Luke has given us and that we trace it through by knowing the scripture and reading the scripture and we see that Jesus very possibly could have been born the first day of tabernacles which is a, a, a holy day, a Sabbath set aside and he was circumcised on the last day, the eighth day which was accustomed to be, to be circumcised uh, on the eighth day. And we read where Zechariah and Elizabeth followed all the customs of the law. So they would have had their child circumcised on the eighth day. If Yeshua was born on the first day of tabernacles, he would have been circumcised on the eighth day of tabernacles, both being holy days in Israel, set aside days that uh, God has said are Sabbaths and that we are to to honor them. I think it's very possible that, uh, that Yeshua was born in the fall and at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we're going to uh, continue this teaching next week 
And uh, we're going to take another part and look at some logic and look at some astronomy and, and see what uh, the stars would be telling us and some other clues from the Scripture and add another step or two in our quest for finding out when the Messiah was born. For instance, this verse that comes right uh, following in Luke chapter 2 says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now, logic would tell us that the shepherds were not in the fields keeping watch over their flock in the winter. They didn't do that. And from my understanding and some research that we've done, we find that that word field may indicate a field and not a pasture where the shepherds always took their sheep to the pastures, now it's to a field, an agricultural field, which would indicate to us that uh, a few days after harvest in the fall, uh, right at tabernacle's time, the shepherds were allowed to take their sheep in and eat the stubble and eat the remains of the harvest. So this verse also could be an indication that it was in the fall around tabernacle's time when the, uh, the shepherds were in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Thank you for watching us today and I encourage you to be with us for the second part as we look at some more clues of why I believe that Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, was born in the fall and not December 25th. Shalom.